Well, I'll tell you what, what a glorious day it's in God's house. I, I love being here. I'm just always overwhelmed at God's presence and the things that he has done for this church. And February marks a very special time at Trinity because this time last year, uh, I, I cast the vision over the church to be a church on the move. And we have seen that carry us into new territory and a new path. But uh, February also was the, when we began our, our new youth group. And being able to see our youth grow and, and, and grow in numbers and spiritually has been so amazing. And I thank God just for the leadership that he has given us for our youth. But today is extra special because today is Vision Sunday. And, and we're going to be talking about the vision that God has for us in our lives. The God, that God has for our church and for our families, uh, where he's taken us. And it's also Groundhog Day. And I love Groundhog Day. You know, they, you can't tell me the guy's not going to see his shadow. It's sunny outside. And, and, uh, but I love Groundhog Day. You can't tell me he's not going to see his shadow. It's nice outside, sunny outside. But it's Groundhog Day. You can't tell me. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about the movie? Some of you got it, some of you didn't. <laughs> I do love Groundhog Day. But today I want to talk about the fact that we don't always know where we're going as, as, as human beings. We sometimes just wander around worrying until we just land somewhere. But here's the thing about God. God has a vision for our life and for our church. And he is great in letting us know what that vision is as long as we are faithful to him. As long as we zero in on what he is saying. And we can remain unified in the mission to go, therefore, to baptize, to teach, and more importantly to seek if we're faithful. In Proverbs 29, 18, it talks about God's people fumble around and they can't see what God is doing in their lives. But if we, if we see what his vision is, if we follow what he wants us to do, we can be blessed. It says, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. But happy is he who keeps the law. When we ignore the vision that God has for us, that's when we start to see uh, um, uh, the vision inside of our churches. That's when we start to see politics inside of our churches and selfishness. But if we are a church that has a clear vision that God has called for us, the knowledge of putting him first in everything that we do, then it will keep us focused on the task at hand. And I've been praying so hard for what God has has wanted me to preach about as far as our vision for 2020 and how I can get across our vision of being a church on the move and the vision that was cast in this time last year. And I mean, I just think about well, this time last year we had 20 odd people in the church. I mean, look around and see how many people is here today. It's just God has a vision for us. And I really wanted to talk about it today and, and uh, just know that the best is yet to come in Trinity. The best is yet to come for this church, for this community, for our families. And uh, that's what makes me excited, to know that the best is yet to come. For most of us here, I, what I talk about today probably isn't going to be earth-shattering. It's probably not going to be something you haven't heard before. But it's a good needed reminder of what it means to be a church on the move and how you can be a part of it. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew chapter 10, we'll be looking at verses 16 through 22. Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 through 22. It's impossible to move forward if you don't have a clear vision. One of the best advice I was ever given was by a pastor who said, Abram, no matter what church you're a part of, if they do not have a clear and strong vision, I can promise you they will be confused, they will be going all different directions, and they won't be able to know what the vision of the church is. And so he said, find a church that has a strong vision. And I've lived by that for a long time. And it reminded me of a story. It reminded me of a story about these three sons. And these three sons were, were very prosperous in their living. And so they, they decided they were going to get something for each of them. They were going to get something different for their elderly mother. And they were so happy and proud to do this. They were living good. So they wanted to do something for their elderly mom. The first son said, I'm going I'm to build mom a beautiful big old house so she can enjoy it in her old age. Second son said, I'm going to get mom a, a fast sports car. I think she'll enjoy going a little bit fast the end of her life. The third son said, you know, I'm going to get my mama, get my mama a parrot. And that parrot's going to quote the Bible for her because mom's vision has been bad lately. And that parrot's going to quote the entire Bible. A few months later, they get a letter from their mother. And it said, Milton, the house that you built me was too big. Gerald, the car that you got me was too small. But my dearest Donald, your simple gift was my favorite. The chicken was delicious. 
<laughs> it's important to have a clear vision in life. So let's all stand for the reading of his holy word, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, we'll start with verse 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men. They will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues, and you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about him or what you are to say, for it will be given you in the hour what you are to say. Verse 20, for it is not you who speaks, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Brother will betray brother to death, father his child, children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But here's the great news. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. May God bless you of his holy word. You may be seated. In 1995, the gray wolf was reintroduced to Yellowstone National Park after a 70-year hiatus in a process that is called rewilding where you reintroduce animals back into their natural habitat. Now at the time, scientists expected there to be a little bit of a ripple effect, but they did not understand or foresee how much of a ripple effect it would actually cause to this national park. Wolves are predators, and, and they kill certain types of animals, but what they didn't realize was they also give life to others. When the wolves were re-entered into the ecosystem in the area, it changed everything, not just the animals that they fed on, but everything. As the wolves began killing coyotes, the rabbit and mouse population increased, which attracted hawks and weasels and foxes and badgers. Because the wolves hadn't been in the area for over 70 years, the, the park was overpopulated by deer, and they overgrazed parts of Yellowstone. But because these gray wolves were back in town, they had new, smaller traffic patterns, and it allowed uh, for new shrubs and, and, and bushes to regenerate. And because of these, these regenerated bushes, there became berries on those shrubs and bushes. And that caused a spike in the bear population. Before they knew it, within six years, the trees in the overgrazed parts of the park had tripled in height. Barren valleys were reforested with different types of trees. As soon as that happened, songbirds began nesting in those trees. Then beavers started chewing them down. And if you know anything about beavers, they're ecosystem engineers. And so they started building dams that created natural habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks as well as fish and, and reptiles. And here's the most fascinating thing about all of it, the, the, the rewilding process. The wolves even changed the behavior of the river because all these ripple effects that took place caused there to be less soil erosion and the channels narrowed and, and pools started to form as the regenerated forest stabilized the riverbanks. The point of me telling you all that is this. Yellowstone National Park needed wolves. When the wolf was out of the equation, it caused unintended consequences that people did not realize it caused. And, and when I look at, at, at the, the Pharisees in the Bible who were called to go out to their community, but they were, they were stuck in their little holier-than-thou bubble. When I look at our churches today, and, and we do the same thing, we're stuck inside of our churches, I, I think about that gray wolf. And how they were taking this hiatus from where they were supposed to be, their natural habitat. And, and when, you, when you look at, at how Jesus began to train his disciples, what did he do? He didn't take them to a building and say, look at this beautiful building. It's so wonderful. We're, we're going to go outside and put a sign on it that says, J.C. in the Disciples Baptist Church. And we're going we're gonna to wait for people to come to us. And we're going to preach the message to the masses. And we're going to live stream it so that people can sleep in their beds. And everything's going to be wonderful and great. No, no, he didn't do that. What, what did Jesus do? He began to train his disciples. He began to rewild them back into the community. Rewild them. Jesus said himself, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So Jesus spent the better part of his three-year ministry traveling and preaching and being on the move with his disciples. It was literally the traveling salvation show. When it comes to the vision that we have for this church, to be a church on the move, what we're saying is we really want to take the Great Commission and we want to apply it literally. We want to be on the move. We want to be reintroduced into our communities and not be a separate entity 
that, that, that as the church has been for 70 years, we want to be part of our communities. We don't want to be confined to our pews. We want to treat this as a huddle. We want to treat this church as a huddle. Today is going to be, what is the 54th annual Super Bowl, right? 54th annual. And so these teams are going to get in their locker rooms, and they're going to draw up the plays of how they're going to do their, their game, you know, how, what they're going to be looking out for. They're going to have all this stuff planned out in the locker room. But you know what they're not going to do? They're not going to play the game in the locker room. They're not going to sit there in the locker room and say, okay, I'm going to wait for them to come to us. Hopefully the cameras will come to us. Everybody's going to come to us, and we're going to just have the game. No, they understand in their heads that the game is played where? In the field. On the field. And so I, people think, I, you know, hey, well, of course the game is, but this is what we do in our churches. We, we, we come inside of our churches, and we treat this as if this is where the game is played. This ain't where the game's played. The game's played out in the community. That's where lives are going to be changed. That's where we're going to be taking the hard hits. That's where the victories are going to be won. This is just supposed to be a, a huddle, a place where we can come together and encourage one another and get a game plan together. One of my favorite games I used to play growing up was a game called Hide and Seek. To an eight-year-old, that's an adrenaline rush, especially when you got three older brothers, you know, three other brothers, and, and they don't know how to play games to save their lives, and you were just the best at everything, and so you loved playing Hide and Seek. It was great. They'll kill me when they hear that, but it was great. And, and here's the thing, as long as I've played that game, because I've had, I've had nieces and nephews, I've had younger siblings, I've had, I'm doing it with my kids now, we're all playing the game, I've played hide and seek for 30 something years. I've never once seen, the, seen uh, somebody that was hiding from the seeker hide where he's counting at. Never once I'm like, hey, alright, I'm going to hide right next to the guy that's counting. Why? Because he's hiding, right? He doesn't hide right next to the guy that's counting. And I've never in my life seen the guy that's counting look for the people who are hiding around the area where he was counting at. What do they do? You have to go to the places where they're what? Hiding. Because they're hiding. They don't want to be caught. And so you have to go and seek them out. And as a church on the move, this is where our head has to be at in the same process. We have to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to the, to the place where people are hiding and running from God and showing them what evangelism looks like. And the way that we want to do this is the same way that Jesus instructed his 12 disciples to do this. To, to go to the lost sheep, to preach saying the kingdom of God is at hand and as freely as you receive, freely give. We need to be rewild in this process. We need to be rewild in our communities. So the first thing we have to do is seek. We have, we've been talking about this word seek all throughout the month of January. I hope you guys are getting sick of it. Because when you get sick of it, that's where I know it's starting to get in your brain. Seek. And seek. How we're supposed to be seeking and saving that which is lost. But today I want you to understand how you're supposed to seek. In verse 16, Jesus tells, us, uh, tells the disciples, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents. And innocent as doves. One of the truest statements. One of the truest statements that anybody could ever say is the world is very hostile to Christians. They're very hostile to Christians. They do not like us very much. And, and here's the thing. The world is just as comfortable with us sitting in our pews as we are. They like us being here. They want us inside of our churches so that we have nothing to do with them. And so one of the questions that we have to do as a church on the move is how can we advance the kingdom of God in a world that is wanting and waiting to destroy us? How can we be the Christ-like in an ungodly world? And Jesus gives us the answer. We must be, have the wisdom of the serpent with the innocence of the doves. This is something Christians miss. We miss this all the time because at some point in time, the world has told us that we're supposed to be quiet, timid, and keep to ourselves. And we're like, okay, we'll do that. We won't speak up because we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to make anybody nervous or, 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 or make people uncomfortable. But, but this is the thing that we miss. He says, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And this isn't referring to when Satan came to us in the form of a, of a serpent. Something we miss sometimes. He's talking about the actual wisdom of a snake itself. Baptists get a bad rap. As long as I've been a Baptist, we always get a bad rap. They, they, they say three things about us all the time. Chickens aren't safe around us. Because our fish sunny dinners we like to have. Back seats are always worn down with all those back seat badness here. And then, and then they go, and they always bring up snake handling. You know? 
Theologically, common sense wise, I I've never understood the snake handling thing. But y'all have nothing to worry about because I hate snakes. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I could, I would, I'd be the first one out of here. I, my wife, precious wife, <laughs> she knows that I would protect her when it comes to anything. I'm her protector. I made an oath, I'd protect her. But she also knows that if there's a snake, she's on her own. <laughs> I'm the first one to God. And I, I've given her clear instructions. She's got to take care of the kids and, you know, make sure they're okay. But, uh, you know, I just, I can't, I can't do it, man. Something about snakes is panic. I just get so panicked. But as much as I hate snakes, I also understand what Jesus is trying to get at in this passage, which is the fact that snakes are pretty small. They have these sensory organs where they can see and they have good vision and, and they have a hearing and smell and they see you before you even see them. They see you before you even see them. They, don't under, they understand that in order for them to survive, sometimes they have to be able to blend in. Sometimes they have to avoid things. Sometimes they have to hide. And, and, and you know what? They're, they're more afraid of us. than That's what people tell me at least. They're more afraid of you than they are. I don't know if that's true because they never seem to be scared of me when I'm walking. But that's what they say. And they don't attack for no reason. This is also what I've been told. I don't know how accurate this is. I try to stay away. But they don't, they don't attack for no reason. Right. If they're film threatened, then they'll attack. And when they attack, they attack to kill. <laughs> I've seen that. One day we were, <laughs> one day Isaiah was two years old. We go, we go walking out of our garage, and sure enough, there was a big old 20 footer. <laughs> <laughs> and so I do what I'm supposed to do. I grab that thing. That was bigger than that. 20 feet. I grab, I grab my son. <sighs> and uh, anyway, it was a very traumatizing experience for myself. <laughs> and I let it go because I was too afraid to catch it, you know? <laughs> oh, man. <sighs> but those are the snakes. Ugh. Jesus said, look, when you go out in this world, know that the, the world is evil. Know that the world wants to destroy you. Know that the, the, the world is full of people who, who do not like Christians. He says, be, be aware of it. When I see pastors struggling with the world attacking them, or I see other Christians struggling, you know, I think about this passage. Because whether you're a pastor or a teacher or a deacon or a member, you have to understand that God has called us to come to him. God has called us to, to, to love the people that he loves, and he loves everybody. No matter how strange or different some of you guys are to here today, we're supposed to love one another. Even when we disagree with one another, we're supposed to love one another. But guess what? He tells us not to do it blindly. Pay, pay attention to this. Jesus didn't spend all, Jesus did not spend as, 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 as much as popular, everybody says, you know, Jesus hung out with the sinners. Listen, I get it. He didn't hang out with the sinners so that, so that he could become one of them and party and have a good time. No, no, no. Jesus hung out with the sinners because he wanted to see them change. He didn't just hang out with them blindly. And, and the thing about Jesus is Jesus spent more time alone in prayer than he did hanging out with the sinners. So I get so frustrated when people go, I need to hang out with the sinners because Jesus hung out with the sinners. No, you just are wanting an excuse to party. You're wanting an excuse to go to the clubs. Jesus didn't do that. He was smart about who he went to. He was very strategic when it came to the people that he hung out with. And, and the thing about Jesus, if you look to his ministry, he left areas when he felt like his life or the disciples' lives were in danger. He would leave. Jesus didn't spend all of his time just blindly hanging out with the sinners. Blindly hanging out with non-believers. He was strategic. And so we have to understand those things. And when it comes to being a church on the move, we need to learn to innocently reach into our community. And we need to learn to be smart as a snake and avoid some things. We need to have the wisdom of knowing when to go out and start preaching to people. And when our preaching is doing more harm to people than anything else. And what do I mean by that? I've seen more people turn away from God because of harmful preaching than I have any other preaching. And I'm not just even talking about false preaching. I'm talking about hard preaching. The, 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 and, and I'm not talking about, the, you know, there's some truths that will, should always be on the forefront, right? The, the fact that there is a heaven and a hell. The fact that there is sins like homosexuality and abortion. I'm talking about last year when we took our, our youth to Winter Jam. I don't know if you've ever been to Winter Jam. This is a Christian event with Christian music and Christian preaching. And it was a bunch of Christians sitting in line to go to this Christian event. And then another group of Christians come over and start yelling at us, saying we're going to go to hell because we're at this Christian event. 
How confusing is this? And I, I remember sitting in line, and there was a, a, a youth group on the next line over. And this little girl who was a non-believer said, what are they doing? And the youth pastor's trying to explain to this little girl that, that, this, that they're preaching against the music that we're listening to. She said, well, isn't it, isn't it Christian music? Aren't you guys all Christians sitting in line to listen to this Christian? She could not understand. And, and it was frustrating to me because the, these street preachers were preaching a harmful message that they, they did not recognize. They weren't wise as serpents. They didn't know who they were preaching to. It's a per perfect example of Christians who were not being wise as serpents. Because yes, the result of sin is death. And yes, we need to preach that message. But there's more to it. There's more to it because we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And the gift of God is through uh, His Son, which is eternal life. So innocently, the, the street preachers were trying to share a message, but they were unwise in doing so. Yes, Jesus wanted to, to His disciples to innocently preach to anyone who would listen. But He wanted them to be wise. Jesus was the perfect example of this principle. He understood that there would be times when he had to be very gentle in his approach. When he would talk to a guy like Zacchaeus, and he would try to explain the message to Zacchaeus. He did it in a very gentle way. When he, when he would have to talk to somebody like, like Nicodemus, the Pharisee, Nicodemus, he did it in a very gentle way. But he also knew there was going to be times when he had to be very wise and, and talk to the Pharisees, especially when they were testing them, in a very smart way. Right? When the Pharisees went and the adulterer woman was sitting there and the Pharisee was trying to trick Jesus and Jesus says, hey, he who is, is without sin should cast the first stone. That was a pretty wise thing that Jesus did. See what I'm saying? Or like the moment when he came into the temple and started flipping those temple tables. Right? Jesus knew at that moment that he couldn't walk into that temple and say, hey, hey guys. Hey guys, this is my dad's church. I really don't think you should be doing this here. No, he, no, he, had, to, he, knew he had to get their attention. And he had to go in there and start flipping temple tables. And so as we look at at reaching our community for the love of God, to rewild ourselves in the natural habitat of our community, where Jesus saw his ministry, we know what it means to be a church on the move and, and how you can be a part of it, which is our second point. Church on the move. Because the church is made up of, of people. It has nothing to do with this building. It has nothing to do with the, the name on the side of the building. We want people to know God, not with head knowledge. We want people to know God with heart knowledge. For you football, football fans, my cousin is Russell Wilson, NFL Seattle Seahawks champion, MVP. He's in his prime, Russell Wilson. All right? Now, if you don't know who he is, Google. He looks just like him. <laughs> he does. Why is this? Because he's my cousin. Now, if you say, Abram, do you know Russell Wilson? I will tell you yes. He's my cousin. Of course I know Russell Wilson. If you said, Abram, have you ever met Russell Wilson? I'll say no. <laughs> have you ever spoken to him on the phone? No. You ever spoken to him in person? No. Have you ever been in the same room as Russell Wilson? No. <laughs> if you were to go to Seattle and meet him, and you were to talk to him, and you would be like, hey, do you know Abram from Foundman? Your cousin? Would he be able to, would he know me? No, he wouldn't. <laughs> but he's still my cousin and I still think I know him do I know him? yes <laughs> alright I know of him but I don't know him per se this is the problem with the church today this is the problem with people today if you were to ask people if they know God 99% of people would say yeah of course I know God of course I know God. This is the problem with our churches. You talk to people in church, do you know God? They say, of course, we're in church. Everyone knows God. Have you ever spoken to him? Have you ever been in his presence? If, if you die today and you get face to face with God, would God be able to say that he knows you? John 17, 13 says the way to have eternal life is to know the only true God and Jesus Christ who God sent. We want people to know God. Not just know Him with their head, but know Him with their heart. We want people to experience life at its best. And if you already know the Lord, we want you to know Him even better. Because I know there are people who sit in churches and they don't know Jesus any more than they did when they received Him 30 years ago. My prayer is that every person in this town, every single person, knows Jesus. 
That's why we must keep growing spiritually and in numbers and in baptisms. I pray that this church, uh, the churches around us start growing. I pray every day for the churches around us to start growing. Because if they're growing and we're growing and everybody's growing, that means lives are being changed. And those people say, Amen, when you focus too much on the community. Amen, you focus too much on other people. Amen, you focus on everything else but me. Here's the thing. The flu's going around. If I shake everybody's hand all the time, you know I'm going to get the flu. Y'all are trying to make me have the flu. I know you guys are. I can see it in your eyes. If I could just give Avery my flu, everything would be great. <laughs> I was kidding. Flu serious. Some of you all want to shake my hand and you go, oh, by the way, I have flu. <laughs> I won't be at church tonight. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, let me tell you something. I want to see our community change. I want to see people in our community experience the wonder and grace and, and love of, of God. And if you're here for my attention or to be recognized by me, you're here for the wrong reasons. There's plenty of churches. This is a, this is a fact. If you want to go to a small church that everyone knows your name, and you know, there's plenty of churches and families that are like that. If you want a church where people will, will, will say, hey, I'll, I'll bless you, I'll bless you, I'll bless you, then there's plenty of churches like that. TV evangelists do that all the time. You give a certain type of money, they'll give you all the blessings that you want in your life. If you want, if you want to, to serve our community, if you want to pour into our community, if you want to love the people of our community, and, and not come here for yourself, but come here so people can experience the love of God, then you are at the right church. Amen. Amen. I want us to be a church that doesn't sit there and say, when is the church going to be there for me? But a church that says, when are we going to be there for others? I wish I had this kind of preacher. I wish, I, I wish they wouldn't do those boring hymns. Why are they doing these boring hymns? I like the new stuff. Why does Abram always focus on the youth? Why does my child have to sit with me during worship? I want to reach to the, to the husband who's far from God. I want to reach to the to the mother that's far from God, to the sister, to the to the to to the to the to the wife, to the to the to the niece and nephew that are far from God. I want us to be a church on the move, not a church on our butts, not a church on our seats, not a church in our cliques, not a church in the groove. Because we could be that. I can find that kind of a church. I want to be a church on the move. I want to be a church that focuses on the community. So understand what the vision of the church is. And when you make a decision to join our church, when you make a decision to be a part of the growth and the many ministries that we have, the, the many volunteer opportunities that we have, understand that we're a praying fellowship dedicated to the ministry of Jesus Christ with the purpose to seek and save that which is lost with the vision to be on the move. If you're here for other reasons, you're here for the wrong one. Beginning next week in the foyer, we're going to have a list of events and a list of of, of ministries that we are a part of, a, midst of, uh, a list of opportunities, uh, teams uh, that you can sign up for and, and start helping volunteer and serve. We're going to have a big old list so nobody can say, I don't know where to serve. We'll have a list of them, right? And the list will get you far in life. I have a list for everything in my life. I have a list of what I'm going to wear every week. I have a list of what I'm going to try to eat. Oh, that doesn't work all the time because McDonald's been calling my name lately. <laughs> Lists work. So I have a list for you. Because I believe in the people that are sitting here today. Because you know what? Every single, every single night before I go to bed, one of my prayers is, I have a lot of prayer. But one of my prayers always is, God, send us the people. Send us the people that we can uh, help us make the change in our community. Send us the people to help us grow our church. Send us the people. Then I get up here and I look over. <laughs> I see you guys. <laughs> I said, that's fine, God. All I asked was a tall ship and a star to sailor by. <laughs> okay. That was from a Willy Wonka movie. <laughs> but I tell you, tonight, this is, tonight during the Super Bowl, whoever wins the Super Bowl, the first question they always ask is, what are you going to do now? And the, whoever wins, whatever it is, the quarterback, they always go, what? I'm going to Disney World. You know? I would love it if, if our church leaves every Sunday. What are you going to do now? I'm going to heaven. 
I'm going to heaven. When we leave the church, we should be shouting. Anyone here today that says, Lord, come into my life. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Lord, be there with guide me. My God's going to do it. You know why? Because he promises that he's going to do it. Amen. He promises. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. He says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. So many people say to me, Abram, I I'm questioning my salvation. I I'm questioning if I die tomorrow, will I go to heaven? I'm, I'm, I'm worried about if I'm worthy enough to be saved. I was baptized a long time ago, but I'm not 100% sure if I understood it then. I'm not even 100% sure if I understand it now. And, and, and when I read that verse, I, Paul didn't say, you know, work, work out your salvation and it's going to be all easy and wonderful and great. And, and it's, it's perfect. No, no. He said, work it out with fear and trembling. Work it out with fear and trembling. Have a little bit of nervousness about you when you talk about your salvation. Work it out. Because if you think you're, you're, you're saved, you're probably not saved. If you don't know with a shadow of that, then you don't believe it in your heart that you're saved. So get saved. Make a decision. Get rebaptized. Re rededicate your life. Work it out with fear and trembling. Give your life over to God once and for all. Come forward and let me pray with you. Come forward and, and, and pray at the altar. Come forward and make a decision to change your life forever. We begin this time of invitation. If there's anybody here that wants to make a decision to join our church and be part of the church on the move. Church not here for, for, for the 99. We're here for the one that's lost. Same way that Jesus was. Because here's the thing. You guys, would, you guys would not like Jesus if he was a preacher. You wouldn't like him. He'd step on your toes every Sunday. He'd focus on the young kids in the church. He'd sit there and he'd leave the 99 for the one. And when you question him, he'd say, you guys are already found. Why would I be preaching to you? We need to go reach out to the one. The one that's far from God. That's the kind of church I want to see. A church on the move. A church not confined to our views. A church that's going out to our community and making a difference. Because guess what? HDTV isn't going to come to found to make a difference in our community. Right? Our government's not going to come into battle and make a difference in our community. It's going to be the people in our churches who preach a message of Jesus Christ that's going to make a difference. And if you're sitting there and you don't know who Jesus Christ is, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I pray today is the day that you make that decision. Don't wait a moment longer. The altar is open. Let us pray. Every gracious Father, we thank you, God, for this glorious day. We thank you, God, for sending your son to this earth to die on that cross for our sins. God, there are a lot of churches that are doing a lot of things. Some are doing it for the right reasons, some are doing it for the wrong reasons, God. I believe every church has a purpose. And I know that the purpose of this church is to be a church on the move. To be on the move for the kingdom of God. And I pray, God, that you guide us, that you lead us,